Hello, I wasn't expecting to be making a part 5 to this A590 video series, but when I found this I couldn't resist. Take a look at these, they're both A590s but can you spot the difference? If you remember back in part 2 I announced that the original A590s came with a different case design, and after lots of searching I finally found one. So in this video we're going to take a look at it, see if it has the original Epson drive inside and see if it works. So putting these side by side you can clearly see the difference. I'm not exactly sure when Commodore changed the design, I thought originally it may have been limited to the Epson hard drives, however I've seen a picture of another one like this and this one has a western digital drive inside, maybe it was old stock of case lids. I'm sure you'll agree this design makes the A590 even rarer and this one claims to be an Epson drive too. Now I have powered this up and it doesn't do anything, not even a sound, so let's open it up and see what we find inside. Just like the other A590s we only need to undo the screws at the four corners, and once inside we can see that this has the original Epson drive. Note the two pieces of paper stuck on it noting no defects and no errors. Yes, that was a thing. I want to also take a look at the lid. I wondered how the LEDs were clipped into this and now we could finally see. They're only pressure fitted into place. These flat LEDs are held with a small piece of plastic, although I haven't seen this type of LED for quite some time. Now back to the drive side again, this has to be a revision 6 board too given the placement of the XT and power connectors. So let's remove the hard drive platform and take a look at the PCB. A close up reveals it's not configured with any RAM and all the RAM sockets are empty. It's got revision 4.4 of the ROMs, so now at least I should be able to check if the ROMs I had in the other A590 were indeed 4.4 as well. Aside from these notes, it all looks in good condition, with the exception of some dust and a bug. Ok, so that's the usual bits out of the way, let's take a look at the drive and see if we can get some life out of it, although remember it has been about 30 years and they weren't that reliable. First we'll need to get off the support plate and once inside we can see the back. Hmm, Epson makes stepper motors too, that stepper motor is most likely being used to move the head across the disc. To see why it's not spinning up we'll have to remove the PCB, starting by removing this ribbon cable. Once we've removed it we can see the spindle motor, again made by Epson. For those wondering, and I was, Seco Epson or Seco Epson Corp is actually the company's full name. Now turning this motor I notice there's a section in it where it gets a little bit stuck. I'm not really sure why, but watching it as I move around it almost looks like the coils are moving and it's sticking against something so maybe something inside's moved. However, the drive doesn't work so we can't make it any worse. One interesting little preconception with hard drives is that they're sealed, well they're not. They usually have a filtered air hole somewhere to allow for expansion and contraction due to temperature changes. I don't think we're concerned with voiding the warranty now are we? Removing the lid? Well look at that. So this style of drive was probably before they actually auto parked when being powered off, and I'm guessing over time the heads have gotten stuck to the disc surface. Having removed the sticker on the spindle motor hoping to get inside, I now see the only thing I can do is to remove the drive heads and finally then remove the platter. I'm trying to be as careful as possible, but as I said, it didn't work before. Those heads did feel like they were somewhat stuck to the disc. Those platters are held in by pressure and once these three screws are removed they simply can be lifted out. A close up of them reveals some marks left by the head and a few scratches, I guess this could have been a head crash from many years ago. Now onto the motor, I'm guessing that these screws will allow access to it, oh wait the motor is actually freely spinning, so what was causing it to get stuck? Time to reassemble the platter and see if it still spins freely, and it is. So I'll add the drive heads back, a little tricky and I don't want to damage them, I'm sure there's some of you that are worried about alignment but I suspect that certain tolerances and movement is allowed. With those back in, the spindle is sticking again. Now you can see I accidentally moved the heads while unscrewing them and it's interesting to see what the pulley system used to move them. So let's take a look at those heads. Well they look ok, I can't work out if the head is actually mounted on rubber or plastic. Let's try a little bit of isopropanol on them, as I said I can't make it any worse. And now to reassemble it again and it seems to be running much smoother. So let's put it all back together again and give it a test, starting with the drive cover, the spindle sticker, the dampening supports, and finally the PCB, trying to remember which screws went where. Finally I'm reattaching this little flat cable on the side, which we know has something to do with the read write heads now. With the drive back together again I gave it another test, but it still didn't spin up. 
So I took the PCB back off the back of the drive again and watch what I discovered. If while powered up I give the motor a little head start, it gently spins up and spins properly. Now for this first test I disconnected the read write heads, so I've reconnected them and tried again. Weird noises, those heads are trying to move by the sound of it and I'm wondering if they're having the same issues as the spindle motor did. So let's have a look inside and see what's actually happening. It's difficult to see but the heads are moving slightly. Now there's a few reasons for both of these actions and I suspect the motor is failing to auto start on itself may be to do with the problem with dried out capacitors as there's no signs of leaks anywhere. So I've decided to recap the board. There's quite a few so I won't show them all but once removed three of them had stopped working completely. It's interesting to see now that the drive starts all by itself so that was at least one of the issues. Also note that the drive has no issues moving the head and I think this is part of an initial startup to get the head into a known location. And as you can see this weird behaviour again, maybe a little more pronounced now and I'm guessing it's trying to find the first track on the drive. You can see it keeps repeating the same sequence, most likely the heads or the disc platters are damaged beyond repair now for this to work. A shame, but I didn't have high hopes for it to start with. Another thing I wanted to check was the ROMs. When I put that Western Digital hard drive into the other A590 I had, with what I assumed were 4.4 ROMs, it didn't work until I swapped in the 4.6 ROMs. I wanted to check if they were indeed 4.4 ROMs and if so, were they damaged? So I dumped the 4.4 ROMs from this drive and after comparing them they were identical and this leads me to conclude that the 4.4 ROMs only ever work with Epson drives. Makes sense I guess. Now I do have one further thought for debate. Do I swap this lid with the one for my much earlier A590 to give it the lid it really deserves? Interesting they both have the same serial number. While I'm thinking about that, and now that I know how the LEDs are supposed to fit in the lid, I can make that correction at least. So I've 3D printed these little LED inserts to fit in the lid, and I've ordered some flat LEDs to use. This case may not have the original design, but at least it will be a little closer to how it originally was. And if anyone knows when they switched from the red and green to yellow and green, I'd be interested to know. Now there's two things I want to do. First, let's give this lid, case and PCB a good clean. Next, let's give it the upgrade it should have had. I'm going to install a full 2 megabytes of RAM into this, and once we're complete we'll run the RAM tester to ensure they're all ok. Whilst it's open, the 4.4 ROMs aren't any good to anyone, so I'm going to give it shiny new version 7 ROMs. And to finish it off, I'm going to install a blue SCSI version 2 inside. With that done we can put it all together. And while we're at it, we can fit those new LEDs in the other case as well. Nice. Well that was a bit of a rabbit hole and it's a shame I couldn't get the original drive working. Not everything can be repaired or at least it's beyond my skills. I have been really interested to see what was on that drive as well. I may revisit that drive again at some point and see if I can salvage anything from it but for now I'll keep it to one side as it's an interesting part of history. I hope you found this interesting. If you did, consider subscribing and maybe consider supporting me on Patreon too. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.